Welcome to Tomorrow Never Knows with me, Bob Wilson, and Sir Warren Brown of the Beatles Kingdom. Our special guest today is Spencer Drake, and as far as record albums go, he has you covered. Spencer's done work for Lennon, McCartney, the Ramones, Joan Jett, and so many more. Lend us your ears and we'll give you a show. But first, Beatles Magazine is a publication with 370 plus million visitors in all their pages, read by thousands of fans around the world every day. Beatles News updated daily, 24 hours, audio, video, photos, interviews, contests, additional materials, and more. Follow Beatles Magazine, the most complete online coverage, 24 hours a day, and how many days a week, Warren? Eight days a week. All right. Spencer, I'm going to take over here. We're going to put Bulldog in the pen for a little while. And uh, you'll hear him growling in the background, but don't worry, he don't bite, okay? <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Um, Spencer, you went to uh, Bridgeport with a Yale facility and then ended up in a commune to Woodstock, New York. And not too many people can say this. Can you please tell us that story and what happened to you when you got to New York? Yeah, I mean, um, I went to University of Bridgeport. I had a, a amazing luck to have a Yale faculty in the graphic design department. So I was schooled with a Yale training, uh, you might say. And uh, funny story is my cousin was going to Yale for different things, and he, and he used to call me up and said, Spencer, you're paying half the money, you're getting the same training as I'm getting up at Yale. And so, uh, so my life really started in a very good and by luck way, uh, by, you know, by chance. And then, you know, I sort of was a visionary in college. Um, I ran a film club and ran underground movies. I used to get movies from uh, the, the factory, Andy Warhol, uh, in New York, and uh, ran underground movies. They didn't know what I was doing. I was way ahead of my time. And and then um, I was doing different things in college, uh, which were, I would call visionary, you know. And mm -hmm. then I left college and sort of went to an advertising agency, and that was crazy, but I learned a lot. Uh, but I wasn't satisfied, so I left the advertising agency and got my, you know, I sort of got a, tr a learning experience, uh, a bad one, because changes happen every day, if you know advertising, which is crazy, yeah. and I was going through a rough thing in my personal life, so I said, I'm leaving, I'm getting out of here, so I, I, I don't know, uh, one thing led to another, and I was going to travel to California, and I ended up in a commune in Woodstock in Shandaken and uh, with a bunch of uh, single mothers with kids and all kinds of people. It was wild. I had a fun I could summer. Imagine. I got to say, I had a fun summer, though. I learned a great <laughs> experience. You know, it was just a great experience. So everything was out in the open, everything. You name it, it was there. But it was a fun experience. I've got to say, I learned a lot, um, opened me up to a lot of things. And then after that, that folded up in Woodstock, and then uh, eventually I came into New York, and I was living with this girl in an apartment, so, you know, I was looking for work, and um, I don't know, then, then, my, then my life really starts after that in an amazing way, you know. Wow, that's great. Uh, sounds like a good summer. Um, was that the summer love in 68, or was well, that... Summer Love was really 69, right? 60, and then it carried oh, okay. over to 70, and I was in the 70 area. People right. would come up in buses, visit us, Life Magazine, the whole thing. I mean, i got to tell you, it was wild. 
but yeah, it was can, a fun experience, you know. It really was. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, your first gig, I believe it was for John Lennon and Apple Records. Uh, yeah. What a start that is. And can you describe yeah, that? so th you're on the right track now. So th then i uh looking for work in New York. And so I go down a... I'm down on Fifth Avenue walking. I remember I was walking by the Plaza Hotel, in fact, and I'm ripped dungarees. I'm just looking for a health food store, something for work at that mm. point. And I run into a, a friend who I knew in college, and he's in a three-piece suit, and he knew me. And he says, oh, you do design, remembered. And I, he said, oh, I love your mo underground movies, he said, first thing. And then he says, well, you do design, and that I don't know how he – but he got a hold of the, the, the essence. And I said, yeah. So he said, well, I need a type person to work with me. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm doing trade ads for Apple Records, and now I'm working on John Lennon's Imagine album, you know, trade ads, the trade ads. And I said, whoa, mm. you know. But at that time, it didn't really hit me. <laughs> but it happens to be the most important album probably did in his life, right? Right. And, and, and ends up working together, and the, the famous photograph, which was folded into the album, was used for the trade ad. And okay. um, uh, John sitting at the piano in the in the white room, they call it which you see in certain documentaries, actually. Um, and um, and so I started there. I started, that's what started my life. I, I, like, fell into things. I would fall into things in my life. I was very lucky. And that was, that was the first thing in my life I fell into that was, that I would say, a major play in my life, in design, you know. In a major way, that's for sure. Can you do me a favor? And for people that don't know what a trade ad is, can you explain what that is? Well, yeah, I mean, along with the album, you would have what you call print ads. These are printed advertisements in newspapers and magazines. Mm -hmm. And that's what you call a trade ad. And so people have to do that. I did that, for instance, for a tour on Genesis. I was hired to do that for the Genesis tour in 1979, for instance. And then so, I mean, I'll give you an example, but those are ads that are placed in newspapers and magazines for to promote. I mean, I did it with Sire Records, with Talking Heads, print ads, um, you know, to advertise the, a new album coming out. You know. Right. So, I mean, I did that with with uh, John's Imagine album, and um, I had the luck and fortune to meet him and Yoko when they were in the West Village. That was the other wow. thing. Wow. And so um, it was an experience. I mean, he was really nice to me, um, you know, and Yoko, too. And um, and that started my life. And um, um, and worked with Alan Steckler uh, at Apple, who was the, who was the guy there. So I mean that's how that's how I start. That's how right, life right. Starts. Well, that's a great way to start. And meeting John and Yoko, um, I I would love a start like that. Um, <laughs> it would probably be my last start, but because uh, I probably <laughs> I'd probably fall over and die. But uh, <laughs> that's a great start. I I. Uh, Really appreciate that. Um, what was uh, Yoko like to you? Do you can you recall oh, very that? Very nice. He was, he was more um, quiet, I might say. John was more outward. Um, both treated me very nice, though. <laughs> they treated me very nice. I mean, that's the most important thing. They they were, they were very. I mean, the thing about Yoko, which is very strong in her personality now, is how she treats John in a very pure way in life. Um, and I think that's really amazing. You know, I mean, the way she she um, respects John's, uh, let's say, his afterlife. You know, the way she treats him now in the world. Very honest, pure way. And that's what I like about Yoko. And, of course, Sean, I know, too. And he's a really nice guy and a great musician. You know, um, they're both wonderful people. You know, we've said yeah. more books, you know, or, anyway. Well, wow, that would that would be the highlight of my life. <clears throat> you also worked at some point with uh, Sir Paul McCartney. Can you please tell us about that and spare no details, please? <laughs> well, well uh, yeah, that was Judith and I were designing together. That was later. And um, I got a call from somebody who wanted us to asked us if we wanted to design for MPL records, uh, you know, Paul and Linda's label. I said, yeah, of course. 
And so that's what got us into that. And uh, by the way, Paul and Linda loved our design. I heard that from John Eastman, who gave us our check every time. Mm-hmm. And uh, But we did two albums, one Montavani Orchestra and the other one Roger Williams on MPL. Wow. And um, that was our experience, you know. But uh, they loved our work. So That's... I had a positive on that one. <laughs> yeah. Very positive on that one. Well, but, you're um, doing... You're doing work for Sir Paul McCartney. Anything you do is going to be positive. Yeah, he's a he's a very, um, I would say, a very um, a good guy. You know, definitely. And Linda was too. They loved our work. Can't right. Be better than that, you know. But you know, they were in England and we were in the United States, so we I never had a chance to meet him at that point. But but uh, he. Uh, Eastman would always say, John and Paul, Linda love your work. That's all I had to hear. That's it. I went home with the check. You know, I said, that's great. You know, mm-hmm. I, I that's you know it. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, that was another. So the, I really designed for two of the Beatles, you know, in life, which I'm very happy for. Yeah, that that's amazing. Um, hey, just give me one of them. I'll, I'll be happy for the rest of my life. <laughs> And I'd spare no expense on bragging about it either. <laughs> uh, you you mentioned your partner, Judith. I'm not going to get into that because Bob's going to ask you about her later on. But I just wanted to bring that up to you um, and to the listeners that you do have a partner. And, uh, and that, we'll get into that a little later. But can can you tell us about when you mailed Yoko Ono one of your books, and you wonder if it was a mistake or how did that turn out? Yeah, well, we had done the five hundred forty five book, <clears throat> which was a um, two thousand ten. I had done a book before called forty five RPM in two thousand two, and that's when vinyl was just starting to get. And but the book sold out. And uh, it's funny, all the publishers turned it down except for one, and they didn't pay much. But later I got my money back because the book sold out. And then um, it led to the second book, which is the 545 book, which I need to talk about. And that, when that was completed, I wanted to send books out to certain people in the book. That would be the right thing to do. And one, one thing, one day I woke up and I said, you know, i got to send it to Yoko. got to send it to Sean and Yoko. A co- copy each, and you know, we we sent our movie poster books to them, and uh, got, you know, they really liked that. And so, um, and so Judith calls, I mail out a book to Yoko, and I tell Judith, and she says, What are you out of your mind? We didn't sign the release on the 45s, and she goes, Absolutely mm-hmm. bonkers. And I said, Oh my god, then I thought to myself, Oh, maybe I made a big mistake, but then I thought in the back of my mind, something's told me it was okay, and what happens is two weeks later, I don't hear anything. Two weeks later, I get an envelope from Yoko Studio, and I open it up, and it's a picture of her photographed by Albert Watson with an autograph from her thanking me for the book. <laughs> so I wow. said, oh, my God. I said, that is it. That's it. That's it. You know, you don't have to say hello to me, Yoko. You said hello to me by mail, you know. And right. it was just, you know, it's nice. I think she felt the purity of her book. Yeah, and I think uh, you know Bob Bruins in the book, um, but his great for the in fact the last session I think is on one of the forty five sleeves, and <clears throat> it was a wonderful book. With and by the way, the book has great Beatles sleeves that no one's ever seen. There's a yesterday sleeve in Denmark, um, wow. which I got. It's a beautiful sleeve. Kiss Me Kitten, that's another one. I mean, I, I, nobody knows of the song. <clears throat> Kiss Me Kitten. So that that's a sleeve that was limited edition in England. Um, and there's also a shot, a 45 sleeve with them against the Rolls Royce, which was his sleeve done overseas. Great Beatles sleeves in there, Warren, that right. like, a lot of people never saw. Is you know that the black and white limo that you're talking about? Yeah, it's in my head right now, but uh, but they're leaning against the car in the back. There's this incredible house, you know, beautiful right. estate. And um, and anyway, that, these sleeves are in the book that, and I, I believe that the John and Yoko sleeve, right? So you know, it's like the sleeves in the book. There's a lot of Beatles sleeves. It's a great book to get. It's called Five Hundred Forty Fives, and we did it in 2010. But it's got some Beatles stuff in it. That's amazing, you know. I mean, sleeves. Yeah. 
sounds that interesting. No one's ever seen, you know. Right. It sounds interesting to me. Uh, do you still own the letter for, you got from Yoko? Uh, well, yeah, it's a photograph of her shot by the great Albert Watson. She looks very young. A great. Uh, it's like a full shot of her. And right. The photograph is autographed. I have it. Yeah, I have it in my house. You know, I wow. Have, I have photograph. Yeah. That's a good. That's a nice little keepsake uh, collector item there. Oh yeah, it's like you know, uh, actions speak louder than words. That's what Judas always says. Actions right. speak louder than words. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't have to say anything. She sends me that picture. That's enough for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what you mean there. Um, you mentioned Sean Lennon. Um, I've noticed on your Facebook page that he posts to your page a lot. Um, do you know him personally? Well, yeah, I, I know Sean, but but he didn't. I picked out the photographs. He didn't really post to my page. I picked out those photographs. He's very, you know, it's interesting. He's very open. So in other right. words, if I see a photograph that's pretty cool, I mean, he's got once in a while he comes up with an outrageous photograph. So I'll I'll pick it out. So he, he really doesn't post to me, but I pick out that photograph and I post it in, in my in my uh, you know my file photo file which comes onto my wall on Facebook. You know, so mm -hmm. once in a while, if I see an incredible photograph of him or there's some a visual thing he's done, I'll um, I'll pick it out. But he's very free with that. It's very interesting. I mean, I don't think many people do. I mean, I don't know. He's, he's very open to me. I don't. Th some people don't like that. I really, you know, right. really seriously. I mean, you, you, you run into different things like that. But he's very open with me. Apparently, he likes that. You know, it, it, he knows who I am, and I well, think that's he good. Just appreciates it that I appreciate him. You know, it's kind of a right. Communication, you know? Right. Yeah, I wish I had him doing that to my Facebook page. That'd be nice. <laughs> but anyway, can you tell us about uh, typ uh, typography? I can't say it right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, for those of us who do not know that new term. Well, typography is what they call type, or in the old days, it would be the printed press, the Gutenberg days. You know, they put type together and they print a newspaper so in in the modern day you have your you can set type on computer you know and type is a type of thing that uh, is blended together say in an album cover let's use an example as an album cover you have a visual matter either a photograph or illustration and you put that together what we call type and that's the text matter put it to uh, some sort of typeface um, and, and, you know, you got to be very good with that. It's not easy. I mean, people, a lot of people, uh, that's what makes a great cover is you have to have a, a great typeface in, in the text matter and then along with the visuality. And there's a lot of people who can't do that, believe it or not. I mean, they just don't have a sense of, it's like doing a good photograph, relative. You know, it's like people who do good, it's like, it's got to be in you, I think. It's got to be in you. You can't just teach everything. I mean. People go to school for certain things, and there is, you know, classes on typography as well as classes on design, classes on photography. I think a lot of us think, but I was very lucky. I, I have a good, and, and Judith who works with me, she's very good at typography. So we've won a lot of awards, design awards. Right. Because, but that's what type's all about. It's the element that has to go with the design, with the visuality, and blend together to make an entity which is hopefully award-winning in some way, you know, like that. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, myself, I'm a graphic designer or a graphic artist, whatever you want to call it. And typ uh, typography is a little different than what I do also. So I was interested in that. And uh, yeah. I figured uh, the listeners would like to know what that is. Sure. Sure. That's all we understand. I love that answer, though. That was a good one. Thank you. I'm going to hand it off to the bulldog here. I hear him growling in the background. But I'm going to hand it off to the bulldog and let him bark at you for a little bit. Um, we love the Ramones also. And uh, I know you've had a lot to do with them and Sire Records. Can you please tell us about the work you've done for the Ramones and any Ramones anecdotes, please? Oh, sure. Um, I came to Sire Records 
I was lucky enough to fall into Sire through a friend who was working on Richard Hell and the Voidoids, and and that led to other projects on Sire with Talking Heads and the Pretenders, and one of those acts was the Ramones, who was a very, if you know the Ramones, were a very raucous group, and I was thrown into it literally by the art director, but he liked my work, so he said, look, I'm going to throw you into the Ramones, can't promise anything. He always said this to me, but he always loved my work, you know, and everything would go through, fortunately, in my life with Sire. But uh, but anyway, he threw me in, and I, I went to see them uh, with my portfolio. He says, take your portfolio to, to, to the Irving Plaza, and they're playing a concert. So I said, this sounds crazy. So anyway, I go there anyway, late at night, and they come off the stage, and they were, you know, if you know the Ramones, they were doing 95 thousand miles per hour and then they get up the stage and are totally exhausted right so i'm, I'm seeing Didi. i'll never forget this. Didi ramon is lying against the railing <laughs> and the other guys are just looking at me and that it was not the time to show a portfolio but you know what's funny I, I don't think i ever showed them the portfolio and i ended up just starting in on what would be two projects one was road to ruin the other one's end of the century and also I did some 45s, which are very famous, like Rock and Roll High School and uh, Don't Come Close, Single Sleeves, um, very nice stuff. Uh, but anyway, so let's start with Road to Ruin. Um, John Holmstrom was the illustrator who did the cartoon artwork on the front cover. And I did what we call the typography for the whole inner sleeve and and the cover, and Danny Fields uh, had a who was the manager at that point who I worked with, very famous Danny Fields. He did the photograph that's on the back cover, and we did it. The we printed it. It's very interesting. The first printing is very important. That's the one to get because we do it in a four color, what we call four color and silver. So it's actually silver plus four colors in the first printing. After that, it doesn't happen. By the way, so that's like a collectible, the first printing. <clears throat> but anyway. It was a beautiful cover, and um, and there's always talk about the Ramones don't like cartoons, that type of thing. But it was accepted, and and that was the first cover I worked on. And the inner sleeve had like photographs by Bob Gruen uh, in it, you know. Um, but it, it, you know that album, uh, want to be sedated on it, and uh, some really great stuff actually. Well, that was the Second first album. Ramones album I got, so I love it. Oh, good, good. All right, Bob. All right. Now, the it's second an awesome album, cover. Thank you very much. Yeah, the second that was on what and those albums, by the way, and forty fives are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame archival collection with their other albums from forty fives, by the way, which are Judith and I are in, which is very. But I want to tell you, those albums are in there with the forty some of the forty fives. But anyway, the second album is End of the Century, and that's important too. Because that's the famous Mick Rock front cover photograph. And it makes it more important because they they are not in leather jackets, first of all. This is the only album I think they do without leather jackets. Maybe Adios is the other one with the dinosaur on the front that Marcus Dobby did the artwork. But the other albums basically have them in leather jackets. And anyway, um the, the 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 reason for it was the um and Mick had shot them with and without leather jackets, okay. So I have the shot with the color T shirts and by the way, that is an amazing iconic photograph which is I don't know, it's very historic in rock. It's a credible photograph and, and Mick was always good with color, first of all. So he really brings out these pure colors with the color T shirts and the background and so I think it's a knockout cover, and the, and the leather jacket shot. Uh, they wanted to do. Uh, the, oh, I'm going to complete that uh, thought because the fr front cover was done that way because the label Sire wanted to have more of a commercial look at them, so they they didn't want to have them in leather jackets. So the inner sleeve is a sh I converted the color to a black and white high contrast, put against the color, and that. Uh, like an orange background, I think. Yeah, the orange background. So that that was used, believe it or not. The Ramones love that idea. And so the inner sleeve visual is used for the 45s overseas, like Baby I Love You, for instance. So that was interesting. So, um, But anyway, uh, I was on Mark Your Ramones' serious show. And, uh, 
Marky was mentioning to me that the Ramones loved my design, which I never knew they loved. They all loved it, which is great, by the way, right? So, but he sure. told me that they had a big controversy on that front cover. They voted. They had a vote on this front, the front cover, right? And uh, it turned out to be the cover. It turned out to be the cover. But th- those two albums, I think, are, are really great design albums, really. The other albums, which is interesting, but if you look at the album covers, the other ones are really, I'm being honest with you, they're really not good designs. They're really not good designs. I mean, come on, you know? I mean, but the two I worked on, I think, are really good. And it sounds like an ego trip, but if you look at the covers and put them together with everybody, you can see that, and 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 the Roberta Bailey's a classic, and Danny Fields' cover is a classic, where they're against the wall. You know, those those are di- that's an iconic cover. Those are the other covers, which I think are, you know, ones with the white type on a, and it's a black and white cover where they're against the wall, and then Danny's cover with a pink type, right, and they're against the wall. Those are those are iconic covers too, but other than that. If you look at the Ramones covers, they're really not that good design. If you look at it seriously, well, I love I the two not... you did. You know, I loved Road to Ruin not only because it was the first Ramones album I got. I just thought it was an incredible cover. And End oh, of the you. Century was very different. It was very colorful, the opposite of a black and white, and a definite, yeah. uh, different image for them. But I do that, think they're yeah, great was... covers. And, did and Phil right, Spector uh... have any input? What? In End of the Century. Uh, aside from the music, did Phil Spector, who had a lot, you know, with the end of the century producing? Yeah, but that was a big fight, you know. I mean, they fought tooth and nail with Phil Spector. That was a war. That album was a war. Um, uh, you know, the Ramones and Phil Spector, it was like a civil war. It was ridiculous. I mean, that's all you hear about them fighting. <laughs> you know, that's all I hear in the office. They're fighting. I hear everything in the office. You know, I hear everything. And one thing I heard, yeah, during that album, that was a big fight. That wasn't happy. You know, it started off to be, oh, they're going to have this producer, the wall of sound, everything's got beautiful. It turns out to be a disaster. You know, with Phil and his gun, that's another thing. If you read Marky's book, he talks about it. Marky Ramon's book's really great. He was on, uh, I interviewed him from Punk Globe and uh, on his book, and he has that story. Uh, with the gun, you know what I mean? I mean, it was crazy. I mean, do you want to tell us that one a little bit? It's just the fact that he was, if you know the Phil Spector story, you know, um, you know, he had a gun in the house. He loved and, guns. Uh, threatened people with it. Uh, he didn't kill anybody, but he threatened people with it all the time. And um, during that time, he had he had a gun, you know, and you, you just hear about that. It wasn't much to talk about, really. That's about it. I mean, the guy well, was- I heard Johnny decided that he he wouldn't let them leave his house, and that Johnny finally said he's not going to shoot me, and he left. And then several years later, now he's in jail. So maybe Johnny was lucky, but he must oh, have been yeah. a well, to be with. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there was a borderlines of things that that could have been that would have been disastrous, right? I mean, I, the guy was out of control. You know what I mean? So yes, he was. And, yeah, right. So I mean, I mean that that's literally the. It's enough to say about that one. <laughs> if you follow the Phil Spector story, you'll know he's insane. So he did the same thing with the group, you know, which is unfortunate. But um, uh, during that era, also his Rock and Roll High School, the movie, and then also, um, which is interesting, I, I did the 45 for Rock and Roll High School. I worked on that. Good work. Um, that, that was a really cool movie. I like that movie. It's a lot of fun, actually. A very fun movie. Um, and... Uh, I think the uh, documentary I really like um, is uh, End of the Century, which is a documentary on the Ramones. And that that's a really good documentary. Uh, they did a documentary. Sure. The last one they did was a total disaster, you know, really a total disaster. So, but, you know, um, that's one of the great, it's very important to bring up because of the documentaries. That, I think that's my favorite. It has interviews with everybody in it. It's really great, you know. Um, and the, Ramon, the, the Ramones theme, you know, but uh, you know, um, I I got along with all of them. Johnny, I would, I would meet every so often. He was very nice to me. Um, whatever craziness went on, and there was a lot of craziness. I mean, the group was, you know, they were not exactly the norm, you know. And I was very lucky to work with them. And the idea that they loved my work, I I couldn't get over that. You know, I learned a lot of stuff after I left Sire, certain thing. But I also know that when I did the work, it was always approved. It was printed, 
and that means they like my work. So, you know, with any group I work with on Sire. And Sire well, I love fun. those covers, and I love the 45 cover as well. I think that you did some, you know, I, I love, I think it's classic, and uh, the Ramones hold a special place in my heart, and uh, part of that is definitely the covers. Well, well, you know, it's a great cover, and it's very simple, Don't Come Close, and that's in our 45 book. I, I love that cover. It's very simple with type and color, but it's a great cover. You know, it turns out it stands out. You know, people, it's a rare cover now. I mean, it's, you know, and then, oh, I tell you the rare cover. I got to tell you the rare cover, the Blitzkrieg Bop. That's a rare cover because John Holmstrom did the artwork on that 45. And he told me, he told me he doesn't have a copy of it. I, that's worth a lot of money, by the way. And I actually have a copy. I bought a copy on eBay. But that's mm-hmm. a great cover. It's a John's artwork with type, with written out type. And it was distributed in Europe for the song Blitz Creek Bob. But that's a great that's a great Ramones cover. I'm gonna tell you it's a great art cover. For sure. And so, yeah. you know, I mean you, you know, you follow all this stuff going on. And of course you know that Seymour the owner loved the Ramones, and he told me one day, I told him, I have, um, you know, I had the Ramones poster that I worked on, wrote to own post, was in a, by the way, it was in a 400, uh, a post, 400 punk poster show at the Museum of Arts and Design recently, and um, for this, why I mentioned it, it was put in the MoMA collection, permanent collection, which is a great honor, and the reason I'm telling you is because I sent. I told Seymour, the owner of the label, that the poster is in MoMA collection. He freaked out. He said, "Oh my God, that's incredible!" And he says, "You know, he writes a letter to me. He says, Spencer, you were one of the few people that believed in the Ramones.' And that's a big thing about that. I got to talk to you about was that Seymour loved the Ramones. Warner Brothers did not understand them. Warner Brothers did not understand them and fought with him, but Seymour believed in them." And that was one thing about Seymour, and that's about the Ramones, you know. And it's, like, important to bring out that that they had a really rough time in the beginning. I mean, their whole career was rough. My my, my good friend Monty Melnick was their road manager for their whole career, and, oh, my God, he would tell me, all well, these stories are amazing. But, you know, and then they eventually get to a point where they recognize, you know. And, then of course, then later, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? But But in the beginning, it was rough. It was really rough on Cyra. There were a lot of groups that came in there that were... Well, they were very New York, and it might not have been as easy to get them in other parts of the nation. And then, you know, they were big overseas in a lot of countries and in South America. But they were also close to Joan Jett. Now, did you get to do, I believe, the number six comes into that one with Joan Jett? Well, I did six albums for Joan Jett, um, and that's an interesting story because I just, with Judith... Uh, we had just done Bon Jovi's first album on Polygrams. This is a great story, by the way. And um, they want me to do Lita Ford's first album, which is her biggest album. After that, she kind of dived off the charts, literally. But she was a good singer. But anyway, um, I'm going to do that. And I just finished Joan Jett's Jump Shot, the famous album with Judith. And that was a big album. And that cover is beautiful, the Jump Shot with the yellow background. Dieter Zill photograph in Germany. Beautiful cover. Anyway... So they want me to do Lita Ford's cover, and and so I said, "Wow, this is great! I'm going to start with Lita Ford." I didn't know who she was, but I knew she worked with the Runaways, you know that whole thing. And I said, "Oh, that's cool." I get a call from Joan's manager, and he says, "This is what he said." He says, "Joan and Lita don't get along." Now, <laughs> this is it, Bob. This is it. I mean, he doesn't have to say anything. He doesn't promise me anything. He's making sure that I know that they're not getting along. What he's telling me is, if you know, is that if I work on Lita's cover, forget about Joan. That's what he's telling me. Because he says mm-hmm. I don't get along. Right. right. So what happened was I get off the phone. I got to make this major decision. Am I going to drop a future client, which I just picked up? Or am I going to go with Joan? I love Joan, by the way. I mean, she was just the biggest thing in my life. And, I, and that's what happened. She was such a big thing. I actually dumped Lita. Forget about Polygram, it left my life. But you know what? The managers gave me six albums with her. Now that, I would have never got that with Polygram. Never. Amazing. Never in a million years. Because that's Kurt. not the way they worked. Or anybody worked. They worked. Yeah, you know, you look, great story. The next one, you know. Yeah, so that's a great story. Uh, but Joan was, um, 
an amazing person. I, w- I would come to the office this year, write letters to fans. Um, she you know she has a, a, a very big woman's rights thing. Um, you know, on when she accepted the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee thing, uh, that's another thing. Um, she um, wanted Tommy Price to get an award, and he didn't. You know, and he played with her for uh, close to 15 years, you know, mm-hmm. which is kind of weird that he doesn't get an award. But anyway, that's another story. But that's the way she was, and I loved her. The thing about Joan is I was offered jobs with other famous rockers. And and what what Joan was to me when I first saw her perform um, was that she perspired, and she gave all her everything on the stage. And she and she always had a great band, right? And I, And I liked that. You know, other artists will walk around the stage and sing. She was not like that. I mean, she was just really gave her whole perspiration on the stage all the time. She still does. But that's, I love that. And I said, I got to work with that person. That's it. And the story. So, you know, I was, I was lucky. Uh, and my friend Rick Shore, uh, who worked for FBI booking agency with Miles Copeland's famous label. And Miles Copeland, if you know, if you don't know, Miles Copeland. The police. Uh, oh, the police, right. So uh, Rick Rick was really nice, and he said, hey, Spence, they need a portfolio. Why don't you go down? And, uh, and and you know what? That's an incredible show, by the way. I first saw it. She opens up for James Brown, by the way. James Brown. Nobody knows of this show. She's opening up for James Brown. You can imagine this? Nobody knows That's about the show. And Jones, the Joan freaks don't even know about the show. I'm telling you, they do not know about that show. Can you imagine <laughs> her opening up for James Brown? It was an incredible show with the both of them. It was outrageous. It's another story, you know. Now you ever, you've touched so many icons. Another one is you too. Now you mentioned to me Octung Baby before. How did that come about? Well, yeah, Octung Baby. Uh, okay, it starts off where I'm hired by Island, and that includes first Chris Blackwell, the owner of the label. <clears throat> they wanted me. They they saw my work and they wanted me to get involved with Island, and Chris wanted me to repackage the whole label, which was a huge job. I, it was converting vinyl records to CD packaging. It was a huge job. And along the way was U2 because U2 was the company at that point. You know, they were really the company. And so I would walk in and, and, and the production head would tell me, Spencer, he said, Chris only wants you to work on U2. And I said, whoa, he really likes my work, you know. But I worked on the USA parts. So the albums would come in, and the singles would come in, and 12, I mean, all kinds of things would come in. And I would put that together, the, the special CD and everything, I'd put it together and design it out. Um, and the, the initial design was by Steve Averill, who did a lot of the U2 stuff, by the way, he's a great designer. Um, and he did all the early U2 stuff, designed from Dublin, right, his, his company. And I would sort of complement his work with the stuff that came in the USA. So I got right into that. And, and, and by the way, that's one of the greatest albums they ever did, co-produced by Brian Eno, uh, the photographs by the famous Anton Corbin. Hello. So I worked on that. You talk about design. I mean, that whole package is gorgeous. If you see all the different elements, there are certain single visuals on each package that fit together like a puzzle and become a unit. And I got, I got, you know, I got to tell you a great story, which a lot of people don't know, uh, is that when I got the book, Anton Corbin did a book called U2 and I. It's a beautiful book on his work with U2. He actually photographed, uh, and people, I didn't even know this, people don't know this. He photographed these images for the singles to be put together from an artwork on, on a car. He shot graffiti on a car and that becomes part of this artwork that you piece together when you get the different singles as a puzzle fit together. It's amazing. I mean, you don't know that. Nobody knows that, right? But it's in the book, right? His book. Um, it's just, I was really honored to work on that cover. I mean, that's probably, it is really, one, and people say you should have won that year, um, the best album, but it's one of the greatest albums they ever did. Well, they were hitting stadiums at that time, and they were really on a roll. And uh, you know, it was excellent. Oh, yeah. After excellent. that was Europa. You know, after that was Europa. Next was Europa. But but that album, that packaging, the visuality for the whole is amazing. It really is the whole visuality of the packaging and the marketing. 
I have a black and white a promo with Anton Corbin photographs in black and white, set in the winter time, shots of them in a rail in front of a ra- railway trestle, rail railroad trestle. It's unreal shot. The promo- I mean, the, the photographs are unreal. Anton Corbin, if you know Anton Corbin's work, is one of the greatest photographers ever. Really is. He's done video and everything, but his work is outrageous. I mean, it's just like you work with the best of the best, you know. So, I mean, that was another thing. I mean, when you're designing something and you're working with outrageous photographs, I mean, come on, you know. I mean, that makes a, a whole thing. It's part of the action, you know. But anyway, that was a big thing for me. The YouTube project was very big, and uh, it's still in my life, you know. I mean, it's like, um, uh, oh, great story, great story. You ready for this? Sure. They gave me the album in Britain to look at, uh, like a guide, you know, the the album, the twelve, the uh, album printed in England. Now, this is something that I don't know if anybody knows this, but it's there. In the back of the album, he's got all these square photographs. They're all little square photographs that are pieced together in the front and the back. They're beautiful. But in the back is a picture of one of the group completely nude with his penis showing in color. (laughs) I must have missed that. (laughs) Okay, so now we're talking about England printing something. like Now, England is such a stuffed shirt country. I mean, they always have this thing with censorship. And and here they are putting this album out, right? Their album (laughs) printed that way. Oh, my God, right? And so I get a call from Ireland in New York saying, Spencer, you've got to put a fig leaf over that penis. You know? <laughs> but what happened is Steve Averill told me the real story. He put a little X. Uh, he puts a little X on his penis, a little X, which I think is much better. And so that's a story on that. That's a great story. A great story. All right. You caught me off guard with that one. I have to recuperate, so I'm going to hand over to Warren. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll was... tell you that. You know why that's a great story? Because you two fans do not know that story. I'm going to tell you this right now. But I, I didn't I told, know that story. Uh, I told Edge the story. Edge didn't realize. He almost didn't realize that. And I, t- I met him at the Hard Rock. Edge, you know, a place where he's Bono. He flipped out. He laughed. He was the greatest thing he ever heard in his life. He, he it's like he's did he did all this stuff, but he didn't realize that was going on, you know. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> anyway, I just want to tell you that that's a fun story, very good story, right? 